you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. The CEOs, the motivators, the brilliant minds, the thinkers, and one of them is not me. Anyway, uh, guys, we have a wonderful show for you today. Welcome to Chris Voss Show, the Chris Voss Show.com. Someday I'd like to not have to do that, but you guys seem to like it. And you run up screaming to me at shows and go, the Chris Voss Show.com, and I go, call security. Anyway, guys, uh, welcome to the big show. We certainly appreciate you guys coming by. Thanks for referring the show to your family and friends. We love the uh, anticipated downloads. Downloads are up like 30% this month. Well, what are you guys doing? It's been 13 years. You finally got around to increasing the show's production. And we're going to double or triple again this year. So it's going to be kind of interesting. <laughs> the show keeps growing. So thank you. Thank you for those of you who share the show with your family and friends. Tell them to go to youtube.com forward says Chris Voss, goodreads.com forward says Chris Voss. The big LinkedIn newsletter, that thing grows crazy. I don't know what's going on over there. You'll see a lot of our cool uh, interviews with authors on it. Uh, so check all that stuff out. And if you haven't, I hope you feel guilty for not. No, I'm just kidding. That's some shaming going on. Don't do that, Chris, to your audience. Don't shame your audience. We love you guys. Remember, we're the family that loves you but doesn't judge you, at least not as harsh as your mother-in-law. Today, we have an amazing author and journalist on the show. I'm excited to have him here. Uh, he's going to be talking about his newest book. This is coming out on April 4th, 2023, and it's called The Plot to Save South Africa, The Week Mandela Adverted Civil War and forged a new nation. Justice Malala is on the show with us today, and he is a famed journalist. Uh, he is an award-winning journalist, television host, political commentator, and newspaper columnist. He writes regular weekly columns for the Financial Mail and Times Live in South Africa. He's a political consultant uh, to uh, Lafika Security. Did I pronounce that right, uh, Justice? Absolutely. Uh, you, you're South African, man. You're uh, doing there you go. <laughs> I watched a lot of The Daily Show, and we, we used to have, up until recently, uh, a great host who was a comedian from South Africa, and a brilliant mind, too, as well. Um, he is a regular contributor to The Guardian in London, and his work has been published in the WAPO, I like to call it the WAPO, the Washington Post, the Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, Times of London, and others. Welcome to the show, Justice. How are you, my friend? I'm very good. Thank you for having me. It's such an honor and a pleasure. And uh, and I hope we have some laughs and some, the, some good honor. fun. And we will. Know. There will be laughs. It's kind of like that movie, There Will Be Blood, but there will be laughs. And there might be some blood. I don't know. We'll talk about it. Maybe there's some blood in the book. Uh, but it is an honor to have you as well. Thank you for coming. And congratulations to the new book. Justice, give us a .com or wherever you want people to find you on the interwebs to get to know you better and stalk you maybe. Um, people can follow me on Twitter um, uh, <laughs> at Justice Malala. I, uh, I I try to tweet every so often, particularly seeing as you mentioned a South African uh, on the Daily Show. There's another South African on Twitter. Uh, the jury's out, but hey. Um, so I'm on Twitter. I'm on. Uh, uh, you can find me at justicemalala.com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Justice Malala S A. Um, uh, and yeah, and just Google as well. Love there you that. go, Trevor Noah, the prior Daily Show host. I was, I was, uh, I was definitely. Uh, I, I did, I didn't like that he had to step down, but you know, he's done it for thirteen years. He's done an excellent job, brilliant mind, and a, mm. and a great emissary for South Africa. I think. I don't know. Maybe you guys hate him down there. Do you guys like him? Oh, we love him. We love him. Uh, he's he's one of those. It's like, oh, you're going to America. Are you going to be like Trevor Noah? It's all <laughs> serious. That's the thing down there. Wow. There it's you all go. Fun games. They love him. They love him in South Africa. He it's really so is. His mindset and some of the things he thinks about are brilliant. And so let's get to the brilliant uh, writing that you've done. Now, this isn't your first book, correct? You've done other books. The, I've done other books uh, published in South Africa. I haven't been published elsewhere. Um, awesome. Um, the world has missed out a lot, Chris. I'm there you sure. go. Well, people can still order those books on Amazon, which is the beauty they, of Amazon. They still can. So yeah. I've written, I've written a uh, a political overview of South Africa. It was called uh, "We Have Now Begun Our Descent: 
and mm -hmm. it looked at um, our former president, Jacob Zuma, who was controversial figure, divisive figure, um, in and out of court. Uh, yeah, a very controversial figure. Um, and before then, I'd done a compilation of my uh, satirical columns. Uh, yeah. uh, I used to be, in my other life, a restaurant reviewer, but I always kind of laughed at the Mm -hmm. at politicians instead of writing about the food. So mm -hmm. that was in a book called uh, Let Them Eat Cake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like the concept there. <laughs> and, uh, and before that, I'd written a small fiction book. Um, it, it was uh, it won a small award in South Africa, but it didn't really go that far. But, there you but go. I, actually, something I enjoyed doing, and I loved it. And I was a kid then, so... Yeah. So what motivated you? What was your interest in writing this book, The Plot to Save South Africa? So this book, <laughs> it's it's a bit of a, a roundabout way. You know, you do something, you're 22, you, you something happens to you and you, you live your life. And then you say, but what actually happened there? Mm -hmm. So, so um, for, for the listeners out there, uh, here's a date, 10 April 1993. I'm a 22 year old kid. Um, I get offered a job on the biggest newspaper in the country. It was called The Star. Um, I'm a I'm an intern. I'm downstairs. I'm not even in the newsroom. I'm an intern. I, you know, learning the trade and so forth. And and Easter weekend and Easter weekend in South Africa is a bit like Thanksgiving in the U.S. Every one who can gets out of the big cities and goes to goes to their goes home goes and has their fight with their uncle about politics so ah <laughs> so we call that thanksgiving here in america that's 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 exactly it. so easter weekend 1993 nelson mandela gets out of town nelson mandela had been released uh for three years Democracy had not come to South Africa. So this is the transition period we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And is apartheid mm -hmm. still in place? Is that is that something we're fighting uh, over here? We've got like all the economic blocks. Exactly. It's 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 being dismantled. It's falling mm -hmm. apart in those in those in that period. So Mandela's mm -hmm. been released. Uh, all the apartheid laws are going, but we don't know what's coming. It's mm -hmm. still being spoken between de Klerk, who was the president at the time, and Nelson Mandela at the time. Mm -hmm. But and, they're, and, they're, not reaching, um, they're not reaching a settlement. So Mandela started off, you know, saying de Klerk is a good guy. And mm -hmm. de Klerk started off saying, oh, this guy Mandela is a good guy. I can work with him. Mm -hmm. The two have been going at it saying, how do we build this democracy? And by, by 1993, Easter, uh, April 10, they it's this guy doesn't want to work with me this guy doesn't want to work with me mm -hmm. and they they basically they're fighting so mm -hmm. so that weekend mandela goes off to his uh he he built himself a house uh in the village where he grew up in kunu in the it's in the back of beyond in south africa um um Dittler did the same went to his grandmother's farm in the desert in uh, uh, in South Africa, a bit like sort of going off to, uh, yeah, in the semi-desert out there. Mm -hmm. um, so Johannesburg is empty. Most anyone can who, who can has left town. On that Saturday, the most popular political leader after Nelson Mandela was a youngish guy called Chris Hani. Mm -hmm. Chris Hani was charismatic, was uh, charming. Um, if he went into, if he went into, uh, if he came on the Chris Voss show, he'd say, Chris, what do you like? And he'd say, oh, I love Greek mythology. And he'd start banging on about, you know, whatever Greek mythologists talk about. He said, I love leadership. And he'd say, oh, what did you think of the leadership of Julius Caesar as opposed to blah, blah, blah. He was he was erudite. He read the classics, and you know, he did a thing on on one of the clerics guys at the first. They, they feared him because the, he was the leader of the ANC's military uh, outfit. Sounds like a very smart guy. 
very smart guy, incredibly smart guy. So he was. He would have come on my show, so he, he must have been smart, right? Very, very, very smart. Guy. <laughs> so, so he walks over to this guy in the on the apartheid side of the negotiations, and he knows that this guy studied classics at Oxford University. Oxford and Cambridge held a PhD in the thing. He goes over and says, oh, yeah, I read your PhD um, um, right up on, on Sophocles. And I wanted to say, I think you got it wrong on blah, 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 whatever it was. This guy is sitting there thinking, this guy, I thought he's a terrorist. And, blah, blah, blah. and here he is. He wants to talk about Sophocles with me. Who, who is this guy? So he was that kind of guy, um, popular with the intelligence here popular with angry, radical, young uh, black South Africans who said, you know, the apartheid is bad, we've got to destroy the system and so forth. He was the one guy, and Nelson Mandela did this a lot. When Nelson Mandela went to speak to angry young black kids, uh, youth, he would take Chris Honey with him because Chris Honey was the one guy who could, who could talk to them, essentially. So, so on that day, Chris Honey... It's one, the only, not the only, one of very few ANC leaders who don't take off mm -hmm. um, to, to see relatives and stuff. He stays in Johannesburg with, uh, at his home. He's left home with his 13-year-old daughter. He gets up in the morning. He goes and buys a newspaper, uh, comes back home. He's being stalked by a right-wing um, um right-wing radical who's organized himself a gun and, and so forth. And the guy follows him into his driveway, calls out to him, Mr. Honey. When Chris Honey turns around, he shoots him uh, two times uh, in wow. the chest, um, then shoots him at the back, in the back of the head twice, and the man dies in front of his 13-year-old daughter. Jesus. Now, now this, this happens... I, because I'm a rookie, because I'm an intern, mm. I've been told you must come to work that day. No Thanksgiving for you. No Easter weekend for you. Wow. So I'm sitting in a newsroom in Johannesburg, and my news editor comes running and says, get a car, go out and, and, and go to Chris Honey's home. I say, what's happened to Chris Honey? She says he's been murdered. Mm -hmm. And I run out, I get a car, I go to I go to his house. By the time I get there, other ANC guys are there, the police are there, um, the crowd has built up. And I kind of, you know, take notes, interview people, what's happened, da, da, da. I send in my story, my notes, and so forth. But it was my first day as a reporter. Wow, wow. that's incredible. I mean, it's a sad day, but it's a I sad mean, day. you're there for history. Exactly. So, so, but what happens is that over the next two, three hours, you know, the top reporters, the experienced guys get the call. You got to get back. Chris Honey has been better. Um, and they all come back and, and, you know, I follow the story, but I'm, I'm, I'm pushed off. I'm, I'm not there. Mm -hmm. The story builds up. Nelson Mandela says when he got the call that morning that Chris Honey had been murdered. He writes in his, in his uh, memoir, uh, Long Walk to Freedom, he says, if ever South Africa was going to go into racial warfare, this was the day. Mm -hmm. F.W. de Klerk, who was the president of South Africa at the time, says exactly the same thing in his book. He said, it chilled me when I got this call mm -hmm. because I knew that this, this was it. This was, the, this was the moment we were all dreading we could face racial offer. And, and basically the day proves that the both men were right in that assessment. Um, right wingers drive past the ANC head office, shoot it up. Um, um, that afternoon, I was sent out again to go into Soweto, the biggest black township in Johannesburg. I couldn't go into Soweto because there were barricades, cars were, you know, looted, uh, burnt on the streets. It was maybe not apocalyptic, but semi-apocalyptic. Is that a big mm -hmm. word? Um, so, so it was pretty, it looked bad. It looked like South Africa was about to implode. So, mm -hmm. so your question is, um, why did I write this story? In a way, I wanted to go back to that moment in history 
mm. and say, why didn't we go to war? Why didn't South Africa implode in that week when, when the racial divide was so huge, when, when the words of war were so heightened, when the one side was calling each other names and the other, and, and it looked bad. And the pain, the pain of people who, you know, in the ANC, a lot of the leaders I spoke to at that time and in, and in interviews for this book was, you know, we thought we thought we were building something. We thought this was going to work. And now, now they kill our, our hero. I mean, a... a a survey, a, in fact, an American outfit, Gallup, had done a poll um, just months before then. And, uh, and that showed that Chris Honey was the most popular leader after wow. Nelson Mandela in the country. So, so, you know, essentially Mandela's natural successor was assassinated. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so the, the book is, I, I tried to write it from that moment when Chris Hani is murdered, and the next nine days as the country basically blows up. And what wow. happens then? It, it's it's a sad fact that we that we don't recognize maybe how bad things are until someone dies. I mean, would this be similar to the American experience with Martin Luther King when he was assassinated? You know, we had a, lots of other very youthful brilliant minds bobby kennedy jack kennedy or uh, not jack but john kennedy um you know and and it, it looks like from what i understand about uh, chris hanny is even 30 years later people are asking that question you know what if he had lived what if he had uh, become a leader in south africa you know the the what ifs of uh, of a better prospect of a better future were kind of placed on that person because of their ideals and their and their progressiveness and suddenly they're they're slaughtered in a in a horrific assassination and those dreams die and as i think as a collective of people that believe in uh you know people and and the ideas and uh, okay we're finally going to move past them is that a good comparison to some of the to, yes, to what happened a, with him yeah it's it's um it's a very good comparison it's um mm -hmm. In a way, you know, people would say, whether it's JFK, whether it's Martin Luther King, um, people would say it's the death of the of the of the vision, the death, <clears throat> killing of that of that vision. That that here are people who believed in a better world, in a in a higher, in humanity's higher being, uh, ability to reach to rise above hate and 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 all these small, small things that make us lesser people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and so Chris Hani showed some of that. Um, you know, Chris Hani, you know, this is a kid from a, a very poor place um, where he came from. Um, he, he literally, you know, pulls himself up by the bootstraps, uh, goes to Catholic school, learns Latin, um, does extraordinary things, goes to university at a time when black South Africans couldn't get into uh, most South African universities, um, becomes the, you know, one of the ANC's first kind of guerrilla fighters. In all the time, calls for peace, speaks peace. Um, just before his death, he was talking about there are so many young kids who missed out on an education, they're out on the streets, we've got to find a way to get them to believe in this thing that we're trying to build. So, so the, the dream and the, 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 the way he articulated that dream, if you say to South Africans, what is the meaning of freedom? What is the meaning of freedom after apartheid? You know, Chris Hani articulated that idea better than most, more than most, and, and more eloquently and more inclusively than, than most did. And so, and so to your point, the question about what would have been, what South Africa would have looked like with a, with a Chris Hani still in leadership, maybe not the president, whatever that, uh, the outcome would have been, but it probably would have been a better place hmm. um, you know, you can't say for sure what power does to people, 
but but what he stood for and articulated was a was a kind of values based leadership that isn't spoken about a lot in in the South African political context anyway, uh, except in nostalgic terms. Um, so 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 you know at when South Africa is at its hardest, in its hardest moments, that's when that comes up and it's 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 spoken about and remembered. And and yeah, so so the 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 comparison is is apt. Um, it's the correct one. There you go. One of the one of the saddest part, and I think you nailed it when you said basically the death of dreams. Uh, you know, throughout history, we have these charismatic leaders, these people who capture the imaginations, the dreams, the ideals, the future, the progressiveness. And there are times, sadly, where the ugliness of humanity claws that back or attempts to claws that back. And was the, you know, we have this in America still. We have people that uh, try and incite what they call race wars to create, you know, some sort of war where uh, civil yeah. war will happen and, and uh, you know, racism will take power once again and retain power. And, you know, the, I, I, there was the Baptist church killing of the, of the uh, young man who, who killed a bunch of Baptist parishioners. Um, and uh, people uh, there at the church, you know, and, and we have this a lot going on in America recently with the uh, rise of white supremacy, where they're you know, trying, they have this some sort of fantasy about creating a, a race war um, to regain power. And, and so was that uh, the intent of the, the killer of Chris Hani? Yes. So, so um, what we know is this, um, he, he didn't act alone at the time. Mm -hmm. um, this this relatively young man, he was 39, 40 when he committed uh, the, the assassination. Um, he was heavily influenced by a far right member of parliament um, mm -hmm. at the time. Um, this man, uh, Clive W. Lewis was his name, had, uh, had been in the party of apartheid national party. But when it started um, reforming and saying, this is unworkable. We might not believe in integration, but we have to find some way of making this a bit better. And, you know, across the world in the 1980s, the United States, the anti-apartheid movement there was pushing hard, pushing uh, Ronald Reagan, Reagan to do something, adopt some measures, sanctions, and so forth. So in that time, um, um, he and others walked out and formed what was called the Conservative Party of South Africa. They, they pushed a, essentially the messaging that you, you speak about now, a, a white supremacist, um, far-right ideology, um, and they pushed it through uh, in Parliament. He said some pretty straight-up racist stuff. Wow. Um, but, but they did a lot of work of recruiting, um, um, getting their message out, inviting um, uh, right-wing speakers from all over the world to come and speak to them and say, you know, this is the end of the white race and so forth and so forth. So, so he was a big influencer on the, on the shooter. Um, mm. and, and their plan was that what you had with South Africa and what we, you know, it's not spoken about hugely, is that you had a huge black South African population, but you had a massively sophisticated army run by the apartheid government. People assume that, oh, Nelson Mandela came out of jail and, uh, you know, the power of the anti-apartheid movement would have subdued um, the apartheid government. But to be fair and to be honest, these were, these were evenly matched um, forces. Um, the people will always triumph over time, but many, many, many people would have died fighting against the apartheid government. Yeah. Um, because it had, it had a vastly you know, people don't talk about this now, but South Africa was a nuclear power. Mm -hmm. um, it built up a nuclear uh, uh, arsenal and so forth and so forth. 
So, so uh, you know, this would have blown up. So their hope, their aim was that as they killed Chris Hani, young people, people my age at the time, 22, 20, in their 20s, say, you've killed our hero, we're going out on the streets, and they, they get angry. They would then have triggered the army to get rid of F.W. de Klerk, who was seen as a reformer and, and so forth, get rid of the civilian uh, leaders and take over. The army takes over and says, we're going back to classic apartheid, um, white only benches, um, basically Jim Crow. We wow. go back to that and that's South Africa and forget the rest. Mm -hmm. That was their plan. That was their calculation that whatever happens, mm -hmm. this is what we want to trigger. And so in that week, on that Saturday morning after, after Chris Hani was murdered, that was the vision of what South Africa was becoming. It, it looked anarchic. It, it, it was, for them, it was, yes, the plan is going according to plan. This is, it's working. It's working and working perfectly. So that, that, was, the, that was the key thing. They wanted to trigger a, a racial warfare, the army to take over, and impose martial law using the laws of apartheid and restoring apartheid to where we were basically in 1989 before it all came tumbling down. Wow. You know, the important thing about books like yours and learning about history and studying history, and the whole, I'm, I'm pretty sure my audience uh, appreciates this, uh, but it, it's, it's an important point. When politicians use it, it need to be careful in the words they use because there are people that are outside of reality or outside of uh, whatever that will go to violence. And so we always need to be careful in any country. And we experienced this recently where somebody, you know, posted pictures of using violence against a local prosecutor uh, who's investigating them. And, 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 and they, they removed it, took it down. But the, the pension for using violent language or inciting violence in any way, shape, or form is something we should never have in any politics. And so yeah, I this, just... This history is absolutely that. You see, <laughs> you, I, sometimes it's uncanny. You look at you look at some of the modern day stuff and you mm. say, I've seen this movie before. Yeah. And, and you're absolutely right about the lessons of history here because we have seen it before. And it, it, the consequences are dire and can lead to huge harm. Yeah, especially, I mean, civil war is not, uh, we've, we've been through that in America. It, it's ugly. Uh, so you, you titled the book, The Plot to Save America. What happens next? What, what's the plot that comes in to keep, you know, this, the country from descending into chaos? Oh. So, so the key thing, and, and Chris, I was so happy to be asked to uh, come and speak to you. Um, but mainly, I, I'll tell you honestly, I wrote the book to, to look at myself, and not just myself, but at South Africa, and that moment of huge, huge jeopardy, huge fear, and, and being on the brink. Mm -hmm. But my question was always, I seem to have personally forgotten just how close we were and why we didn't tip over the edge in a way in a way as as i got older i have i have kids now and and i wanted to say yes we came close but why did we how did we pull back what pulled us back mm -hmm. and, and so and so part of it is was to examine some of the key acts by those of those present. So Nelson Mandela in particular, and I follow him through the book, and F.W. de Klerk, who was the president. These were two men who, when de Klerk released Mandela in 1990, Mandela said, this is a man of integrity. De Klerk said, this is a man I can do business with. And they said, we're going to build this thing. By 1993, they disliked each other intensely. They mm -hmm. De Klerk, Mandela said de Klerk is not stopping the political violence that was sweeping across South Africa. Um, de Klerk was saying Mandela is not stopping his supporters from participating in the violence 
and they were at loggerheads all the time. Mm -hmm. so I follow the two of them and what they do in the wake of this thing. And, and, and you know, I, I know you, you, you focus a lot on leadership. And so after first concluding that, look, the, what saved South Africa in that week was, were acts of leadership, not just one act, but acts of leadership that cumulatively pulled this thing back from, from going over the edge. And, and so I tried to look at those. So, so the first thing, Nelson Mandela is at his, uh, at his home. He gets a phone call. He says, this looks like war. Um, and he starts making calls. And one of the first calls he makes is to F.W. de Klerk. Um, de Klerk gets the message uh, at his grandmother's farm, and he speaks to a few of, of the people around him, his key advisors, and he says, this, this is a moment when, you know, <laughs> Chris, until 1990 in South Africa, in fact, even 1993, that day, television was very, you had what was so-called white television and you had black TV stations. Um, um, Nelson Mandela was hardly ever mentioned on the white TV stations and so forth. And on that day, Mandela calls the cleric, they have a 30 minute conversation. Mm -hmm. In this conversation, the cleric says, if I say a word to a, to a young black person, they're going to turn around and say, you are the president of South Africa and my hero has been murdered. And you, what did you do to protect him? Because mm -hmm. over the previous three years, you know, people had said, this man is in danger, protect him, give him a police detail. And that, that had never been done, no protection whatsoever. So, so on that day, for the first time, the two men agree that, okay, Nelson Mandela will go on television that night, will not go for an interview, um, a hard interview with Chris, or he'll go in and he'll address the nation as the leader of the country, not as... So, so it's, it's a historic moment in South Africa. Wow. Nelson Mandela, until 1990, if, if, I, if you or I were a, te a television reporter on South African television, you couldn't mention his name. You were wow. not allowed to mention his name. Wow. Um, um, so, so to even comprehend that this man whose name was unmentionable, you, 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 got, you got sent to jail for, for quoting Nelson Mandela. Holy crap. It's like the Fox News of South <laughs> Africa. <laughs> exactly. But this was state television. <laughs> ah, yeah. so, so, so in a way, then Nelson Mandela that evening appears um, on national television and says, my people, this has happened. I'm calling for peace and so forth and so forth. It's the first thing hmm. that, that that act of leadership, Mandela saying, I'll step up, Hitler saying, I'll step back. And because wow. I can't do anything, you can do something. The people will listen to you, they won't listen to me. It's, it's, so I look at that act itself and what it meant in South Africa at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I also recognize that these are people, they are like me, like you, and, and they have they don't always do they 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 are they are human they are fragile and nelson mandela actually does go on television that evening but nelson mandela couldn't read the auto cue properly for example um he gives probably the worst speech of his life it was a dad so so this is the moment, this is the big moment when Nelson Mandela addresses the nation as the president, not the president, but in the place of the president of the country. And yet the speech was, was, was poor, was bad. Um, mm -hmm. And many elements about it were not great. He, he only got to the studio, he was supposed to be on primetime news at 8 p.m. at the top of the news. He was late getting there. He only did it after 10 p.m. 
um, most people, uh, you know, those who were not scared um, hadn't stayed up for that. Uh, people didn't know what time he was going to speak, so they hadn't kept their television sets on all the time. So many people missed it. And and so I thought about that moment, his own moment of not weakness, but of not stepping up the way many people think, oh, Mandela, da, da, da. And in fact, in historical terms, de Klerk writes in his book that, oh, Mandela went on television that night and he gave the speech of his life. He was amazing. Mm-hmm. And actually, it's not true. Mandela in his own book says, yeah, I went on TV that night and I gave a message of peace and peace descended on the land. Actually not. The, the violence got worse. Um, it looked the next day, the Sunday, just looked even worse. Easter Monday was even worse. And that's when Mandela said, I've got to give another speech. I've got to write a speech. And this time he wrote a second speech and it was, he, he wrote the first five lines himself. And those lines even today are, are, are quoted across South Africa as the moment when Mandela essentially became president. He gave the speech of his life three days wow. later. So the first one wasn't, was but in, in, in my memory, I'll be honest with you, Chris, in my memory, and if you ask many South Africans, what actually happened after Chris Honey died? What stopped it? They'll say, oh, Mandela went on television that night and he's, he gave the speech of his life. Actually not. He gave it three weeks, three days later when wow. many, many people had died. Um, and even then, there are other, other things that I look at in leadership terms that happened that week uh, that we can point to. But, but the great speech of that week was, was actually the second speech three days later. That's, that's amazing. And, and, this, and this, this becomes the seminal moment in the transfer of power from de Klerk to uh, Mandela and in the transition to uh, a non-apartheid government. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm making... I'm making that argument, and I, I would agree with you. So two things happened in that week. Um, first of all, you know, so Mandela gave that speech, and he writes the lines. Um, the, the, the assassins, the, the, the killers, the plotters, had wanted to frame this whole thing as uh, whites have killed a black man and black people are angry and are fighting white people, and white people are going to restore apartheid and it will all be fine. Mm. And they, they were very keen to make this a racial war. Wow. And so Mandela in his speech says, um, no, hold on. He says, um, I'm reaching out to all of you South Africans at this moment of pain. A white man full of hate came to our country and murdered our beloved son. A white woman saw the killer, memorized the registration plate, and called the police. Within 30 minutes, the police had arrested the assassin. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, he did something that in South Africa at that moment was absolutely necessary to say, look, Yes, a white man killed a black, a black leader, but a white woman saw this happening and said, that's my neighbor, and so identified the killer and got him arrested. It was wow. her presence of mind that did that. And so those who want you to go into racial warfare don't want you to know that a white woman saw this guy and a white woman called the police and made sure that this guy got, got arrested. Mm-hmm. So he used, throughout that speech, he used language like that, that contrasts and undercuts the racial message, the racist message, and, and said, this is not, don't do what they want you to do because they're trying to manipulate you. And that was a big moment. But, but as you say, those moments on television, people started saying, where's the leader? Where's the leadership here? Mm-hmm. And the leadership lay in Mandela's hands. Uh, while while Hitler was not there, and and 
that was the beginning of seeing where it was going, how it was unfolding. The second one is something that hasn't been written about. You know, I, I know a lot of your of your listeners are history buffs. Uh, they'll be interested to know that uh, part of what the apartheid government did uh, on its way out in '94 was to order that all government minutes, archives during the apartheid era be taken to, excuse me, the 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 furnaces of the Iron and Steel Corporation in South Africa, big, massive steel manufacturer. Mm-hmm. And those documents were destroyed. Tons and tons. Oh. Uh, there's actually a number of the tons of, of um, archives, archival material that was, that was destroyed. Wow. So, so we don't actually know what kind of discussions went on in in the dying days of the apartheid government. We, we mm-hmm. have no records, they've all been destroyed. But I managed to find uh, a set of, a, a set of, a summary of the minutes mm-hmm. uh, of, the, of the meeting of the, of the apartheid government led by the cleric at that time. And, and in those days, in that week, because of the pressure that was coming to bear because of Chris Hani's murder, um, they agreed that they would give Nelson Mandela uh, an election date. Mm-hmm. They just had to sit down and agree on one. Wow. And secondly, that they would agree to a transitional government. So a, a body that would oversee the, 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 the days, the months before a non-racial free election was held in 1994. Wow. And so those two things happened in that week. So Chris Honey gets murdered, Mandela and the cleric have their chewing and throwing, and that meeting of apartheid, it wasn't actually the cabinet, it was called the State Security Council, and it was a body that, it was the war council of the, of the apartheid government. And they said, okay, we'll give them the, the two demands that the, that Mandela had made, and that that was the tipping point, in my view, uh, the, you know, that's my argument that that was what turned South Africa then brought back the elections, the, the process towards democracy. There you go. One of the one of the horrors that I, you know I look at in life and I try and talk about and I talk about this sometimes on my Facebook. One of the horrors is is. It, it, it's sad that as human beings, we have to hit such a bottom, such a dark place before leaders emerge. And, and the beauty of human nature is that leaders do emerge usually at these times and save us from ourselves. Um, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm reminiscent of what you talk about, uh, Bobby Kennedy's speech in Philadelphia on the, on the eve of or on the night of, of uh, Martin Luther King's murder. And, mm. and he, you know, even his security details going, you can't go out there. There's riots all over America. They're going to riot here. You could be killed. Um, and he goes out and gives a, an incredible passionate speech um, that makes Philadelphia one of the few cities that didn't riot uh, in anger over Martin Luther King's assassination. And his speech is uh, very moving uh, and it's very powerful as is his other speech uh, ripples of the ripples of hope speech that actually was in South America um, and uh, so it, it, it it's sad for me I think the it, you know it's glorious that that this that there the, you know the South Africa finally reached a moment that it could make this crossover but you know I, I wish we would learn from history that why do we have to go so dark why do we have to wait till you know, violence and ugliness, and we hit, have to hit such an ugly bottom to go to to recognize, to look in the mirror, and go, "My God, this is horror that we're doing, and we should change and and, and progress and become a better people." But it's beautiful that leaders save us in these moments, and and you've documented this in your book. No, absolutely, and I I have to agree with you. You know, I. <laughs> I look at our politics today, and by our politics, I mean the world, not just uh, the U.S., not just South Africa. But, but you know, why, why did we get to the point where we are with Russia uh, invading Ukraine um, and, the, and the many, many hardships that 
are already cascading through the world uh, in terms of food shortages and so forth, and the, the and the crises that have been unleashed by that. But but the saddest part of the entire thing is that leaders are allowing themselves to to go to that bottom. Mm-hmm. And no one is stopping and saying, "We've seen this before. Why are you going there?" Um, to de-escalate as much as possible, as quickly as possible. So, so you know, I, I was hoping, you know, I, I, I said earlier that, you know, I was hoping that there would be some leadership lessons from this book. Mm-hmm. Um, but but <laughs> sadly, we don't do, seem to do enough learning from history when, mm-hmm. when it has a lot, a lot to teach us. There you go. Uh, you And you interview a lot of different players and people that are in there. Let me ask you this. Uh, I mean, people should buy the book and read it to, to, to understand the depth of it. But uh, what, was, what was Mandela's, you know, th- there's sometimes reluctance to be pushed into these moments because you don't know how they're going to play out, either politically or civil war or danger. What what is what is Mandela's thought process at this time? Is he a reluctant leader? Does he want to step in? Was the heir apparent this uh, Chris Hani uh, gentleman, uh, or you know, what, where was his thoughts at that moment? Where you're like, holy crap! I I I'm I have the mantle that's been laid at me that or put on me that I have to save this country from civil war, and what I say is is the. Uh, is it, it, it could be could be either the start or the end of it uh, to uh, wrap this up and, and save the world. I mean, it's a hell of a pressure to put on a man. Yeah, it's a huge pressure. You know, there's a. I had some lucky breaks in writing this book. Chris. Um, uh, I got at some point while writing this book, I, I asked uh, uh, a gentleman called uh, Richard Stengel who had. Uh, helped Mandela write uh, uh, Long Walk to Freedom, which is Mandela's biography, mm-hmm. uh, autobiography. And uh, he, at the time, was a young American uh, uh, reporter who got, uh, you know, contracted to go help Mandela write this thing and finish it off. So he kept a diary. And one of the things he writes about in the diary is one of the days in that week when Mandela, he goes along and Mandela goes and speaks at this, um, it's not a stadium, it's an amphitheater, it's a small stage. It's like a, it's like a, a, a Roman kind of, uh, like, you know, where the, the, the Romans would have their big fights in the middle and people surrounding the thing and it's a mm-hmm. very intimate um venue so so as a as a as the speaker you're right in the middle and right next to you there's no kind of stage right next to you is the crowd and it goes up that place was built for eight thousand people on that day twenty five thousand to thirty five thousand people were in there wow Mandela is standing there his bodyguards are around him and he says We've got to stop fighting. We've got to work with the cleric, our enemy, um, to to defuse this moment. Mm-hmm. And the crowd goes nuts and says, "Boo!" They boo him, and they they, they it, wow. it's it's you're talking nonsense here. And Mandela says, "I said to you, sometimes you have to work with people you don't like to achieve your own goal." And they boo him. And wow. afterwards, you know, a militant leader of some other organization comes up and gets rapturous applause because he says, let's go and kill the whites and all that and wow. so forth. Um, but Mandela stood by, he, you know, one of the people I interviewed was um, um, Barbara Masekela, who was uh, Nelson Mandela's chief of staff and famously uh, a sister of the jazz musician uh, Hugh Masekela, who was very famous for all kinds of music and anti-apartheid music, uh, uh, music with anti-apartheid um, um, lyrics. Um, and she said to me, at that point, Mandela felt the burden of leadership, but 
saw it as one of his key missions to deliver democracy to South Africa. So he was prepared to work with anyone if they were they were agreed on where they were going. And him and Declare, one thing they did have was that they the detail did, didn't match, but they, they wanted a new settlement for South Africa. So he felt the burden, and I think he felt he felt the pressure to deliver quickly. He was mm. in his early 70s by then. He'd been in prison 27 years. Um, he wanted to end this thing. He wanted to deliver. Uh, and, and I think he was a reluctant leader. He never really wanted high office. Mm. Uh, when he became president, he wasn't, he wasn't one of those guys who wants the Mercedes Benzes and the big cars. And he, he, he was a nightmare for his uh, protection services. Um, but he wanted to deliver this one thing. And he, I think in that week, it's the one thing he wanted to get through and do. And, and you, so, you, you talk uh, about leadership in your book. Uh, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead and finish. No, 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 I was saying, no, and, and I think in that week, even when he was tired, when he was being booed, when, when it looked bleak, and, and a lot of times, you know, he, he was there. People, people wanted war. There were, there were lots of people in the ANC, leaders of the ANC, who were saying, stop the negotiations. We don't want to go on with this. this. We need to reassess. We need to go back to the bush. Um, Mandela didn't think that was the solution, and he, that, that's why he pushed so hard for an, an alternative and peaceful uh, conclusion to the negotiations. And <clears throat> what's interesting to me, you, you talk about leadership in your book, in the forging, you know, the, the pressure, the, the power, the thing that, that takes men into a point where they, they it's, it's a forging of, 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 I don't know another way to describe it, a forging of fire and, and of crisis that, that, that makes some men save the world and make a difference uh, in, in their leadership. You know, I, there were there were times where I remember one of the stories, I think it was about uh, Ted Kennedy, or maybe it was Bobby, where someone had gone after uh, John F. Kennedy was killed, and they could hear him crying behind the door and 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 uh, upset with the loss of his brother and then coming forward and, and being a leader and speaking out and this is evidently one of mandela's most important moments where he he is in the crucible and 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 and, and, and not only is it a forging of of his mind but the importance of it in history the importance of it in changing everyone's lives in the world uh by by taking south africa from you know, one point to another, and and moving moving forward and progressing as a nation, are so important. And I, I and again, what I want to return to, and I hope it's not lost in the audience, the readers of your book, is that in the future, can we not reach the bottom of having people assassinated? Can we not have people killed and destroyed? That we finally look upon ourselves in the mirror and go, Jesus, what have we become? And and we should stop doing this. Why, why do we have to reach this bottom? You know, can we just can we just give a damn now and care about the future before it has to get so ugly that we have to go? Yeah, maybe we should change. Yeah, um, you know, I, you and I are totally at one on this one. Uh, you know, you you see it, you see it every day. You read the news headlines, you watch uh, uh, media, and you see it going that way again. We're waiting for another Chris Honey, another JFK, another Martin Luther King Jr. We, we're waiting for this to happen to take us right to the bottom. We don't need to go there. Um, and, 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 and this, this repetition is, is uh, quite frankly, uh, it makes us, what is the meaning of learning? What is the meaning of history when we don't take the lessons? It's, uh, <laughs> It's an indictment on all yeah. of us. Uh, it's a it's a quote that I, I I use a lot in the show. People have heard me use. It's my quote. The one thing man can learn from his history is that man never learns from his history, well, <laughs> and thereby we go round and round. That's tough. That's, that's tough. one <laughs> last thing on, on on what you said about the, the the sort of going through the tough moments of the crucible. 
You know, yeah. Nelson Mandela, and I think uh, I, I mentioned it in the book, um, you know, his son, who, who he really loved from his first marriage uh, to Evelyn Masse, um, died while in a car accident while he was in prison. Wow. And, um, and the prison authorities, the government did not allow him to go to the funeral, even in chains. He applied and said, you know, you can chain me. I just want to go to the funeral. And they said no. And he, he writes about Chris Honey that when Chris Honey died, it was like I lost a son. Wow. And he knew what it was like to lose a son and not be able to go and mourn that son. Um, and, and so the story you tell me about, about the Kennedys and, and crying through, through that door in that bedroom is, is, what, is what Mandela went through. You know, that's, that's went through several times with his kids um, in those 27 years in jail when his wife was, was detained, his children were arrested and so forth and so forth. So, you know, why do we have to, why does humanity have to go through this for us to see a pathway to solving our problems? It's really, it, it, it's, it's quite depressing. There you go. Uh, it, it is sad and it's depressing. In fact, uh, in the Bobby Kennedy speech in Philadelphia, the night of uh, Martin Luther King's murder, that's one of the things he quotes. He goes, I too have lost a brother. Um, I, I, you know, I lost my brother, John F. Kennedy, um, to an assassinations, uh, assassin's bullet. I think he puts it, uh, and, um, it's a real, it's, it's a crucible moment. And when you study people and history and leadership and the things that forge them, the things that make them and the things that make a difference, um, in the world and, uh, and eventually move us to a better place. And, and as we've discussed, it's sad that it's darkness um, that we have to go through to get there. And uh, we, should, we should really think about that. And that's why, and, and I think maybe from what you and I have talked about today and what you've written in your book, it, it speaks to how important the quality of leaders are and that we have leaders that bring us together instead of separate us. And we have leaders that call for peace instead of violence. Um, and, uh, that is the thing that I think takes humanity to the next level and, and moves the goalposts to a better place for humanity. You know, we, I, I'm, I've always been moved by, um, by what, uh, President Obama said when he said, you know, we're a country that zigs and zags and, and we move and we move backward and we, and, and, but hopefully over the arc of of our existence and our history, we we move the goalposts forward in the end, and we go that way. And I think everyone needs to recognize that. Um, you know, uh, Bobby Kennedy, and we had Bobby Kennedy's uh, son, uh, or not son, his nephew on the show a couple years ago uh, for his book. And, uh, you know, he talks about each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes an injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope that crosses each other from a million different centers of energy and daring and those ripples will the current which can sweep down the mightiest of walls of oppression and resistance and that was a quote from bobby kennedy's ripple of hope speech um yes. in south africa when he was going there to call leaders on apartheid and stuff yeah so i think uh your book is important and i'm glad you've written it and shared it with us on the thing anything more you want to touch on or tease on the book before we go um um not much i i'm um, I'm so grateful and so moved by that quote uh, 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 from South Africa. I can't tell you how much hope that quote gave to people here. I, I've, I've known of that speech and, and quoted from it, written, lifted that, uh, that quote from it. And, and, and you know, this is, what, this is what leadership does, throw that little pebble and, and create that hope. And, and that sustained a lot of people, even when the US was slow in, for example, condemning the apartheid government and so forth, it was words like those that, that carried a lot of people in this country. And, and, and you know, the, the power of, the, of words and the power of leadership like that is, is crucial in, the, in a world like the one we live in now. 
Um, uh, the one last thing I'd say is, you know, there are many small little lessons that we all get from this, but my my favorite one is uh, is one that I think uh, all leaders should try to, at some point, uh, use. Um, Nelson Mandela had a thing where, you know, he got, he got up at four, and this is a habit picked up in prison because that's when they got up. They were made to get up. But he always went for a long walk, um, and he'd come back energized with new thoughts, new, he'd, you know, say, we must say this in a speech and so forth. So, so if there's anything I can leave the reader with, it's, uh, it's remember to uh, take a walk uh, every so often in the morning, uh, clear your mind. But the other thing he liked to do was he'd get tired from getting up at four. And at about 2.30 or, or 3, uh, if he was feeling tired, he'd go and have a nap for about 30 minutes. In fact, he was insistent. He'd lock himself in his room, uh, close the curtains, make sure it was dark, tell his bodyguard, wake me up in exactly 30 minutes, and he'd have a power nap, and uh, and the guys would wake him up at, in 30 minutes, and he'd work until late at 10, 11 at night. Um, I like that, and I, uh, as I struggle with my next book, I might take a few naps myself and see how that works out. There you go. The power nap. I, I used to tease. I remember when I was a kid, me and my brother, we would tease my old man uh, who was in his 40s for napping. We're like, Dad, you're always napping. <laughs> and now that I'm 55, I get it. I'm like, yeah, there's... Welcome to my world, please. <laughs> but that, that power naps, when I lose all my weight, I have my best dreams, I, I get my best sleep usually uh, from that power nap. So there's something yeah. to that. There you go. It's a nice reset. Well, it's been wonderful to have you on, Justice, and to talk about this important book, this important point of history that we all need to keep learning from. Because, I mean, we're still having it here in America where people are trying to assassinate and kill people to start another race war. And you're like, we, we haven't learned from this yet. Why can we not learn? Why can we not elect leaders and politicians who bring us together, who set a vision for a better place in, in, where we all uh, rise together. You know, a rising tide lifts all boats. The sad part about history and, and moments in history like yours and uh, at that time in South America and then ours in, in current times is we have this we have this idea of scarcity where if I help someone uh, who's marginalized be lifted up, well, that takes away from me. And that's not the greatness of humanity or what America is built on. A rising tide lifts all boats. Everyone benefits. And we need to come from that mentality. No, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you for this conversation. It's been, it's been lovely. It's been great. Thank you so much. There you go. There you go. And thank you for coming as well. It's been an honor to have you. Uh, and, a, and an amazing story in history. Uh, give us your .com so people can find you on the internet, please. Um, uh, justicemalala.com. Uh, the book can be found on Amazon and all, all the other uh, bookstores and so forth. So go out and get it. I really would like you to know the story. It's a, uh, I love the story and I love telling it. And so I, I hope you love listening to it. There you go. Uh, learn from history, folks. The one thing man can learn from his history is man never learns from his history. So let's stop doing that. <laughs> let's learn from history and move to a better place as a, as a human, uh, his humanity, as it were. Uh, order up wherever fine books are sold. It's available April 4th, 2023. The Plot to Save South America. The Weak Mandela Adverted Civil War and Forged New Nation and Changed the World if it were. Uh, Justice Malala is the author we've had on the show today. Thank you very much for coming by the show, Justice. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Manus, for tuning in. You guys are brilliant for always showing up and supporting the show. Uh, go to goodtoreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, and all those great places on the interwebs. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time.